Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we are very pleased to have quite a few people from FHWA with us. And I think this is going to be a very interesting webinar. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat box. We'll be taking questions at the end. Um, right now, everyone except for the presenters is in mute. And if you don't see the chat box for asking questions, you may have to um, open the chat box by clicking on the little orange arrow in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. If you have questions for any of us, if you can't hear or something like that, we do have tech support sort of in the back. My uh, colleague, Mary Ebeling, is on the phone as well. We will also be recording this webinar, so you will be able to access the information afterwards or to pass it on to others. So we'll have the webinar up on our website probably later this afternoon, but no later than tomorrow. So we have people, um, in case people are not familiar with SSTI, I do want to just mention a little bit about SSTI. We are a network of reform-minded DOTs. We are housed at the University of Wisconsin, and we work with uh, about 20 different DOTs around the country on, at three different levels. We do executive level community of practice, as a matter of fact, uh, the participating states are going to be meeting uh, later this week um, so they can talk. And we also do technical assistance with the states. And we're a resource for the larger transportation community. You can find out more information about SSTI on our website, which is ssti.us. We are joined today by uh, quite a few different people. I think this is going to be an interesting webinar. Um, there have been a lot of questions by states and local uh, local municipalities and counties, local jurisdictions about the rules for what the federal government does require or does not require. And in August, FHWA put out a document on misconceptions. 10 top misconceptions about funding and rules for use of uh, federal money and on uh, the national highway system. Uh, they also followed up in October or September, perhaps, I can't remember, with um, a proposed change in the controlling criteria. So we are going to have someone speak about that as well. And this is all to make it easier for states and local communities to make roads and streets more livable, more pedestrian and bike friendly, safer, and more appropriate for their local circumstances. So the first person we are going to hear from is Sherry Shaftling from the Office of Planning, Environment, and Realty. And then she will be passing it over to Dan Goodman from the same office, who will later hear from Gabe Rousseau from the Office of Safety, and Elizabeth Hilton from the Office of Infrastructure, Kevin Sylvester also from the Office of Operations, and Bruce Friedman is going to be on the phone to answer questions at the end as well, but he won't be presenting. So. Sherry, I am going to pass this over to you. And if you just click on the slide, you should be able to then advance the slides. OK, thank you very much. Really appreciate this opportunity to um, share the background and kind of how we came together to prepare this misconceptions document and share it nationally. Uh, and then share what's going on with design flexibility. At the end of the day, uh, federal highways and all the folks around the table here are trying to achieve uh, increased use of uh, and, and volume of bike and pedestrian networks across the country. And so it's going to take all of us communicating design flexibility and getting good messages across to try to get that outcome. 
Um, as you, many of you know, we have been uh, very busy the past year working with the Office of the Secretary and all the offices here and the rest of the modes under USDOT Safer Streets, Safer People Initiative. And it's created just a tremendous amount of dialogue. There's over 230 cities signed up. Uh, we've been out and about at various national conferences. Uh, many of us were at the National Association of City Transportation Officials last week. Uh, we had leadership and staff at the National Walking Summit here in D.C. Um, sharing all of our research initiatives and this particular product about misconceptions. Um, there is just a lot of conversation going on these days and we've uh, wanted to make sure that uh, everyone had accurate information and we've been hearing that there were some obstacles to moving forward. Uh, with the accelerated delivery of these uh, materials and the demand for bike ped networks, uh, it's not clear that everybody's keeping up with all the new information and all the directions. Uh, that can be at our division offices, that can be at the state DOTs, it could be at the MPOs, it could be at the um, with consulting engineers. So uh, we took it on ourselves to uh, try to kind of narrow down the key misconceptions and coordinate amongst all the offices here to try to get the story out and the messages out on uh, accurate information on uh, uh, design, environmental review, as, and funding as well. So uh, we coordinated with the Office of the Secretary and um, this is the product that we have at hand now. So uh, I would, uh, we're going to break this up and have each office kind of share their expertise and background on each one of these. And I would also add that Mick Matsky from our Office of Infrastructure is with us as well. So we've got all the experts that help put this together around the table or on the phone to answer any questions you might have or that might come into the chat pod as well. So uh, Dan, if you could take it from here. Okay, thank you, Sherry. Uh, my name is Dan Goodman. I'm on the livability team in the Office of uh, Human Environment, which is in the Office of Planning, Environment, and Realty at FHWA. Um, I'm going to talk about the first five misconceptions in the misconception document. Um, I hope everybody on the line has, has had a chance to see that document. Um, we are going to go through um, all ten misconceptions and provide sort of a high-level summary um, and then as Sherry mentioned, we're going to talk about the controlling criteria um, proposal that we have, have put out recently um, after we talk about misconceptions. Um, but, but as Sherry mentioned, our goal really is to um, improve project delivery, um, to help connect pedestrian and bicycle networks. Um, we want to improve safety and promote equity um, and really encourage more people to walk and bike. And so that's, that's really what we're, we are getting at here. Um, so the, the first misconception in the misconception document has to do with the Transportation Alternatives Program or the TAP program. Um, and the misconception is that the TAP program is the only federal funding source for pedestrian and bicycle projects. And so we want to clarify that that is false. There are a lot of different federal funding sources um, for pedestrian and bicycle projects. TAP is certainly a popular funding source. Um, and it's supported a lot of great projects around the country over the years. Um, but there are a lot of other um, funding sources that are eligible as well. A few Dan, of them. Dan, have, uh, we, yeah. yeah. The slides are not advancing, so you need to click to advance the slides. There you go. Um, okay. Wonderful. Thank Sorry you. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so a few of the, the funding sources that are eligible that we mentioned in the misconception document. The Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Improvement Program, or CMAC, Surface Transportation Program Funds, Highway Safety Improvement Program Funds, or HSIP, um, National Highway Performance Program, NHPP, um, and Federal Lands and Tribal Transportation Programs. Those are just a few of the programs in addition to TAP that can be used to build um, and implement pedestrian and bicycle projects. One thing that we clarify in the misconceptions document is that all of the programs have different requirements. So obviously, as you move pedestrian and bicycle projects through those funding sources, um, you have to make sure that those projects meet the criteria of each individual funding source. So as an example, CMAC funds need to be used for projects that benefit air quality. HSIP projects need to be consistent with the state strategic highway safety plan and address a highway safety program, uh, a highway safety problem. 
um, NHPP funded projects benefit, they need to benefit the National Highway System corridors. Um, and obviously the, the federal lands and tribal transportation programs projects um, need to benefit federal and tribal lands. Um, so I want to mention one, one um, important source of information is the pedestrian and bicycle funding opportunities table that is on FHWA's pedestrian and bicycle program website. That lists all of the different federal funding sources and all of the different types of pedestrian and bicycle projects. So it's a matrix where you can see which, which types of pedestrian and bicycle projects are eligible for which, which federal funding program. Is there, um, is there a slide that has that, um, has that on it? Because we're still on one. On, I wasn't sure if we were still on one. It's on the, 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 the federal funding table is on our FHWA website. Okay. I just wanted um, to make sure thing, that, the, that the slides were being advanced because people were asking. I'm sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> okay, we can put the address to that in the chat box um, to the to the federal funding table. Um, another thing I want to just just clarify is that you can use multiple funding sources to fund one project, and and we would encourage you to work with your division office in your state to clarify the details for that. So the second. Uh, misconception that we mention in the document um, is that federal transportation funds can't be used to enhance the local roadway network. Again, this is false. This is a misconception. Um, FHWA guidelines allow NH NHS capacity and safety needs to be addressed through a mix of on-system and parallel system network streets. Um, so we know that all roads that have a functional classification higher than local roads or rural minor collectors are el eligible for federal aid funding through STP. Um, and then projects on local roads and rural minor collectors may be eligible in some cases. Um, and, and obviously STP, TAP, and HTIP funds um, can be used for pedestrian and bike projects along any public road or trail without any location restriction. So that is a, a important clarification for us to make. The third uh, misconception in our document has to do with separated bike lanes. And then when we talk about separated bike lanes, we're also talking about protected bike lanes and cycle tracks. All those terms refer to the same facility. Um, FHWA just put out a separated bike lane planning and design guide. Um, one of the things that the guide clarifies is that yes, this is one of the tools that you can use in the toolbox to create connected bicycle networks. And you can use federal funds um, to implement separated bike lanes and cycle tracks and protected bike lanes. Um, the federal funding table that I mentioned before, um, we did add a new row specifically for separated bike lanes to, um, to clarify which federal funding sources you can use to implement that one particular facility type. Okay, so moving on to, to number four has to do with the use of federal funds and road diets. Um, a myth that we've heard um, is that you can't use federal funds to implement road diets, and that is false. You can use federal funds um, to implement road diets. We, in fact, encourage and support it. Road diets are one of our Everyday Counts um, initiatives. Um, we have a web page specifically on the topic um, one of the reasons, one of the important reasons that we support and promote road diets is a really significant safety benefit um, that results when you implement them. So in many communities, we see a 20 to 60 percent reduction in crashes. It's pretty common when we implement um, road diets. And when I say road diets, we're, um, to clarify, we're generally talking about removing motor vehicle lanes um, from a roadway and reallocating that space. Um, for, for things like bike lanes, sidewalks, parking, transit use, turning lanes, medians, um, or pedestrian refuge islands. All features that make the roadway um, serve the needs of all users better, um, while also, you know, obviously seeing that important safety benefit. Um, so road diets are one of FHWA's proven safety countermeasures, um, and in our um, misconceptions document, we provide a link to the, to the web page that provides detailed information on road diets, including um, the recently released road diet informational guide 
um, which is available on the Office of Safety's web page. So now the fifth misconception um, that, that I'm going to talk about um, has to do with non-motorized projects and CMAQ funding. Um, there's, there is a myth that we've heard that non-motorized projects can't compete effectively for CMAQ funding, and that's false. Um, in fact, states have funded more than $1.5 billion in pedestrian and bicycle projects through the CMAQ program um, since 1993. Um, the, the projects need to help meet requirements of the Clean Air Act, um, so they, the funding is available to reduce congestion and improve air quality um, for areas that do not meet the national ambient air quality standards for ozone, carbon monoxide, um, and particulate matter. Um, so, so CMAQ is a good funding source for pedestrian and bi uh, bicycle projects, and in fact, um, can, can, they can compete very well for that funding um, in many states. So now I'm going to, to move on to number six, and I'm going to introduce Elizabeth Hilton from our Office of Infrastructure um, to talk about um, the design misconception number six. Elizabeth? Thanks, Dan. Misconception number six is that the Green Book is the design standard for all federal aid projects, and we wanted to clarify that this is false. The Federal Highway Administration adopted the AASHTO Green Book as the design standard for projects on the national highway system, other than projects on the interstate system. But states may adopt their own standards for non-NHS projects. And the Green Book does provide a lot of flexibility in design. Uh, when a Green Book standard applies, but an element of the design is outside of the Green Book parameters, another option is to uh, process a design exception, request a design exception, and which you go through and document uh, the reasons that you uh, are unable to meet the Green Book. But that's only a requirement from Federal Highway Administration on the national highway system. FHWA's 2013 uh, flexibility memo supports the flexible approach to planning and design of bicycle and pedestrian facilities. And the memo outlined uh, several additional resources that build off the flexibilities provided in the AASHTO PED Guide and the AASHTO Bike Guide, as well as the Green Book. And some of those resources include the NACTO Urban Bikeway Design Guide, uh, the NACTO Urban Street Design Guide, um, ITEs Designing Walkable, uh, Urban Walkable Thoroughfares, and Federal Highway Administration separated bike lane guide, or separated uh, bike lane guide, planning and design guide. I wanted to ask uh, Kevin Sylvester if he'd talk about the second part of uh, myth number six, which really uh, ties in uh, to the MUTCD. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, we wanted to take this opportunity to also uh, talk about the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices since we were talking about uh, national standards for design. Uh, the MUTCD uh, governs all traffic control devices on roads open to public travel uh, in the United States. Um, and this, is, this applies regardless of funding source or jurisdiction, whether it's privately or publicly owned, um, or, and uh, applies regardless of the roadway classification system. Um, the MUTCD contains a lot of information about bicycle facilities. In fact, there's an entire part, part nine, that's dedicated uh, exclusively to applications on bicycle facilities, whether they're uh, on-street facilities or shared-use paths, um, also at the uh, interface between the paths and the streets. Um, compliance with the MUTCD is required, actually, is required in accordance with uh, the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, in addition to the flexibility that the MUTCD provides through guidance and option provisions, the MUTCD also contains a mechanism for experimenting with novel traffic control devices, and that's found in Section 1A10. Uh, if there is a situation where a unique application of a, an existing traffic control device or a brand new type of traffic control device is found to be warranted, uh, then that device, um, you have the opportunity to apply for official experimentation through the Federal Highway Administration, and uh, 
it would involve um, collecting data over a number of uh, over a, a certain time period and looking at the ex experience with those devices to see if they're uh, working as intended and also in the end to see if they're also appropriate for national implementation and adoption in the METCD. Um, some external, just be aware that some external resources sometimes include traffic control devices that don't comply with the METCD and those might actually be um, under authorized experiments. So if you see something that um, is either in a presentation or in a photo somewhere, sometimes these pop up, uh, just be sure to check in the METCD before uh, kind of just taking that concept and implementing it. Um, and there's also a, at the METCD website, um, there is a frequently asked questions uh, with a link to the status of bicycle uh, traffic control devices, whether they're experimental, allowed, or, or whatever. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn this over to Gabe Rousseau. Uh, Dan Good, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. We're actually going to pass it back to Elizabeth to talk about number seven. All right. And number seven pertains to minimum lane width on the national highway system and on the local roads if federal funds are used. And the uh, myth is that you cannot go below 11 foot lane width on the national highway system. Uh, this myth is also false. There's actually no minimum lane width requirement to be eligible for federal funding. Uh, states may adopt their own standards as we mentioned already on the NHS. And uh, the NHS includes a lot of major arterials in important roadways, so uh, for many of those roadways, the Green Book does uh, say we should have at least an 11-foot uh, lane, but the Green Book also allows for lesser lane widths on low-speed facilities and on lower volume roadways in rural areas, for example, um, situations in which the research shows that uh, narrow lanes would not negatively impact uh, safety if implemented based on the context. So there's no outright prohibition against using uh, lane widths uh, less um, than these values in the MIP. Um, and if it, here again, if you cannot meet the value that's stated in the Green Book for that type of uh, roadway that you have, the functional classification and so forth, then uh, you may have some very good reasons you can't. Uh, and some important trade-offs you're trying to balance on that project. And so an option is to justify uh, through a design exception uh, that, that the uh, design you're proposing is uh, reasonable. And uh, we've got more information on uh, design standards and design exceptions on our website. And uh, if you look at the myths online, there's a link, there's a link there. Uh, certainly in appropriate context, uh, narrower lanes combined with other features associated with them can be marginally safer than wider lanes. And FHWA supports the use of sound engineering judgment and design. Uh, we frame this discussion in terms of nominal safety versus substantive safety. And nominal safety means that your design meets the technical uh, standards, say in the Green Book, uh, substantive safety means that the design is actually going to achieve low crash rates uh, relative uh, to expectations uh, that you may have otherwise had. Um, we have a lot of, of guidance on the web um, to assist engineers in creating roads that are substantively safe uh, instead of simply meeting uh, minimum values contained in various uh, manuals. And some of those are highlighted here. The Highway Safety Manual has a lot of good information that 10 years ago we didn't have. Uh, the interactive highway safety design model can be very useful, as well as uh, safety analysts and our crash modification factor clearinghouse. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Gabe Rousseau with our Office of Safety. All right, thanks, Elizabeth. So I'm going to handle myth number eight, and that is that curb extensions, trees, and roundabouts cannot be used on the national highway system. And, and this is, there is no prohibition on, on um, using these types of elements on NHS. And I want to talk, I want to highlight two in particular. The curb extensions, uh, you know, or bulb outs, as they're often called, are a feature that, that can have a, a substantial benefit for, for pedestrians and crossing roadways. And, 
Dan had earlier mentioned, uh, actually I think a couple times, uh, proven safety countermeasures have been mentioned. And these are uh, uh, you know, design elements that the Office of Safety um, notes that have a, a, a research, have, have a proven benefit based on research on safety, uh, but aren't yet widely implemented necessarily across the country and certain parts of the country. So we're promoting these things. Uh, medians and crossing islands are one of our proven safety countermeasures, and curb extensions and bulb outs can provide a substantial benefit when packaged with, with these types of features. So these are good things to use, and we highlight them in a number of our resources, including PedSafe, which is an expert system for, for diagnosing and treating pedestrian safety problems. Um, I also want to mention roundabouts uh, in particular, which again are a proven safety countermeasure, and Dan had earlier mentioned Everyday Counts, uh, which is our uh, FHWA initiative to promote um, innovation and, and getting um, you know, you know, states and, and localities to, to consider um, new ways of doing business and, and improving safety operations, et cetera. Uh, roundabouts were part of our EDC2 effort um, and continue to be something that we heavily promote for the benefits that they offer for, for all road users as long with, along with uh, operational benefits that they provide too. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kevin. Thanks, Kate. So myth number nine uh, is about speed limits, and the myth is speed limits must be set using the 85th percentile method. Uh, this is obviously false. Um, we believe that the myth typically comes from a recommendation in the MUTCD that uh, recommends setting speed limits within five miles per hour of the 85th percentile speed. However, that's a recommendation, not a requirement. Um, the requirement actually is that speed zones other than statutory speeds, uh, so posted speed zones, must be based on an engineering study, and that would include an analysis of the current speed distribution of free-flowing vehicles and includes the 85th percentile speed. Um, we, uh, in order to, to, so the 85th percentile is one factor in the engineering decision to set posted speed limits. Uh, Federal Highways has another, a, a, a number of um, resources to help engineers with making a decision to set their speed limits, including methods and practices for setting speed limits, um, FHWA's US Limits 2, which is a uh, web-based tool to help to help uh, engineers in making decisions uh, on their speed limits, and other approaches that are referenced uh, throughout the misconceptions document to aid engineers with that uh, as well. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Sherry. Thank you. Um, we hope that all of these, uh, all this information on design criteria and flexibility will actually help accelerate project delivery. Uh, people are very anxious to get these projects on the ground and kind of reduce their transaction and overhead costs and really focus on improving the network. So we hope all the design material uh, helps with uh, not taking time out to have to argue with folks about what design is going to work or that we've got to do more design exceptions. But the other area that came up was making sure we're choosing the right environmental document between EISs and EAs and categorical exclusions. And so the main question that came up, I'm going to have uh, Harold Peaks, who's joined us, who's the team lead for our Office of Project Development and Environmental Review for a uh, project development team lead, that um, he's going to address the question that deals with uh, right-of-way and CEs. Harold? OK, thank you, Sherry. Uh, the, uh, the question. As, as presented, says bicycle and pedestrian projects must be within the existing right-of-way to be eligible for a categorical exclusion. And uh, this is false. Uh, one of the things we uh, have to consistently make clear is that the eligibility for a federal aid project to be considered a categorical exclusion really is simply about the extent to which that project impacts the uh, resources in the surrounding areas or community to the point where they are significant, considered significant impacts. If a project impact uh, of, uh, of building a bike path facility or any other federal aid project uh, generates significant impacts, then you have to do an environmental impact statement. When uh, a uh, project sponsor is not sure whether it will, that impact will be a significant impact or not, then they generally have to do an environmental assessment uh, that would lead to a finding of no significant impact. As an example, uh, a bike path facility might cross over some sensitive uh, 
uh, environmental resources and may in fact, uh, the construction part may affect that resource to the extent that it's determined that it's a significant impact. In that case, you would not be able to use a categoric exclusion. And as to whether or not it has to be within existing right-of-way, uh, certainly bikepack projects can be federal aid jobs in and of themselves. They do not have to be necessarily a part of an existing highway project to, to be eligible for federal aid funds. So two things. <clears throat> First, the, the bikeway project could be a standalone project in and of itself, and it really depends on the impact of that action as to whether or not it's categorized as a categorical exclusion or not. And it's, it's essentially and completely about the nature of the impact and the extent of the impact. Uh, part of the NEPA regulations speak to context and intensity. So to determine whether something is significant or not in terms of its impact, you would have to look at the, the context in which is being, the action is being taken and the intensity of the effect. So that, that is false. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. We appreciate it. Um, this is Dan Goodman again. Um, so we've gone through the 10 uh, misconceptions in the document. Um, and now um, I want to pass it back to Elizabeth Hilton um, in our Office of Infrastructure. Um, in, in working with Robbie, we understand that you all were really interested in learning a little bit more about this proposal. Um, so we wanted to take some time to walk you through it. And I'd like to pass it back to to Elizabeth Hilton in our Office of Infrastructure to help us do that. Elizabeth? Okay, thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. Um, we'll talk about the controlling criteria. We've had 13 controlling criteria that uh, FHWA set aside uh, many years ago, and we're going to talk about some proposed changes to that. Um, in 2000, uh, FHWA has adopted the 2011 Green Book. We talked about that during one of the earlier uh, myths, and the 2005 Interstate Standards as the standards for highway design on NH studies. And our regulations also um, allow for the approval of design exceptions when those standards are not met. I'm trying to see if I yeah. get my. Here, let me let me con uh, give you the control. Um, and I also, while I'm doing that, I just want to remind participants that if you have questions, you can type them into the chat box at any time, and we'll take those at the end. OK, you should be able to click on the slide and change them now. OK, all right. I'm going to try it here. OK, great. Uh, back in 1985, Federal Highway set aside what were believed to be the most important design criteria and designated them as controlling criteria for design. And so design exceptions are required when those controlling criteria are not met for uh, roadways on the national highway system. Uh, they're not, design exceptions are not required by federal highways for the other numerous criteria uh, that are contained in the Green Book. And in designating those controlling criteria, you know, we were trying to recognize that some criteria impact safety and operations uh, more than others. We're now proposing some revisions to the list of controlling criteria based on recent research. Um, as I mentioned, these controlling criteria have been in place for 30 years. And the proposed changes were published as a notice in the Federal Register on October 7th. And we're inviting comments through December 7th. And we're also, as part of this notice, clarifying uh, Federal Highway's expectations on the level of documentation needed for design exceptions. So let me just walk through uh, those proposed changes quickly here. Uh, the recent research contained in uh, NCHRP Report 783 examined the safety and operational impact of the existing controlling criteria. And the research found that the 13 controlling criteria had minimal influence on safety or operations of urban streets. But on high-speed roadways, a stronger connection to safety and operations was found um, for some criteria more than, more than others. So based on the findings of the research and Federal Highway's assessment and experience and consistent with our performance-based practical design, 
uh, effort. Uh, we're proposing that the controlling criteria be revised. These are the 13 controlling criteria that were set forth in 1985. And we're proposing to eliminate three of the controlling criteria. The bridge width is proposed to be removed because the lane and shoulder width criteria apply to bridges as well as to roadways. So any deficiency in the bridge width would um, be addressed through a design exception uh, to lane or shoulder width criteria. Vertical alignment uh, we propose to remove because there were some overlapping uh, requirements. Uh, crest vertical curve design was already covered under the stopping site distance criteria. Um, grade was explicitly covered as a separate criterion. So that really left only SAG vertical curve length to be covered under the vertical alignment criterion. And while Research has confirmed that there's an interrelationship between the headlight illumination and the SAG vertical curve design uh, and sight distance to uh, features in the roadway. There's really no research that's extended the combined effect uh, of those elements to crashes. And furthermore, uh, when you're driving on a SAG on a roadway through a SAG vertical curve, unless you also have a horizontal curve or an overhead structure or something like that, uh, the SAG curve itself is not critical under daytime conditions when drivers can see beyond the SAG. And at night, even on a, a flat uh, roadway section, drivers outdrive uh, their headlights um, even absent the curve. So they're really not going to be able to see even on a flat section of road. Uh, past their past their headlights, and then we also propose to remove a lateral offset to obstruction or horizontal clearance, as it was originally called, because on uh, uh, rural roadways, the controlling criteria for shoulder width ensures that there will be at least uh, that 18 inches of lateral offset. And it's really a, an element that's more relevant to urban and suburban roadways to ensure that mirrors aren't uh, hitting something on the roadside uh, right next to the curb and so forth. We're also proposing to rename some of the controlling criteria that are being retained. Uh, horizontal alignment would be uh, renamed to horizontal curve radius because super elevation and stopping site distance are covered under separate criteria. Grade, we propose to change to maximum grade, uh, thereby dropping minimum grade as a controlling criteria. And structural capacity, uh, we propose to rename as design loading structural capacity to clarify that the controlling criteria is related to the design of the structure, not the load rating. So the resulting uh, 10 controlling criteria that we propose uh, are shown here. And then another um, key aspect of the proposed changes is that we propose to introduce some context into how these controlling criteria are applied. So right now, the 13 criteria are applied to every project on the NHS, uh, regardless of context. Uh, with this proposal, um, we're reflecting the research that was done that showed that many of these are less influential on safety operations in a low-speed urban environment than they are in a rural uh, environment, high-speed environment. So, and many recognizing that many urban and suburban streets were added to the NHS under MAP 21, so the application of our current controlling criteria had expanded to that expanded NHS system. So consistent with our uh, risk-based approach to stewardship and oversight, uh, our proposal is to focus application of those 10 controlling criteria on high-speed roadways, those roadways with a design speed of greater than or equal to 50 miles an hour. And in the lower speed environment, the only controlling criteria we propose to have are design speed and design loading structural capacity. Okay, the, the other 
thing the notice discusses is documenting design exceptions. And while all the criteria contained in the adopt adopted standards are uh, important design considerations, they do not all affect uh, safety and operations to the same degree, and they shouldn't require the same level of administrative control. Um, Federal Highways encourages agencies to document all design decisions. However, we would only, uh, as I mentioned previously, we only require formal written design exceptions uh, when the controlling criteria are not met. The proposed revisions to the controlling criteria will reduce the need for design exceptions submitted to uh, Federal Highway Administration or on our behalf and uh, should result in a more context sensitive approach that's consistent with our performance based practical design efforts. Let's see. Uh, in addition, like so, we're going to mention uh, or clarify the documentation that we expect to see on design exception requests. Uh, we won't be seeing as many of these at Federal Highways, um, but when we do have a design exception, we'd like to have some um, uniformity in how we're handling those across the country. And that will help states have a more consistent approach to design exceptions as well. In many cases, um, the state has uh, assumed responsibility for the approval of design exceptions. And in that case, um, we, we would like the state to be using, they're really acting on Federal Highway's behalf. And so we also want to clarify the level of documentation that's expected with design exceptions. Sorry, I'm having a little technical difficulty, but I'm getting there. So we outline in this uh, controlling criteria notice uh, the minimum uh, things that we believe a design exception, good design exception do documentation should include, uh, specifically the design criteria that are not being met, a description of the existing roadway characteristics, and what alternatives were looked at um, before the decision was made to uh, not meet a design standard. Uh, what proposed mitigation there might be, maybe some additional signage or lighting or some other measures that would help uh, mitigate that uh, reduced standard. And then the compatibility with the adjacent sections of roadway and whether or not a future project might be undertaken that would uh, bring this uh, section into compliance with the full standards. The design exception documentation should also compare a, a design that meets the standards to the proposed design um, with the design exception and should support with a quantitative analysis the expected operational and safety performance uh, if you met the standard and if you uh, use a reduced uh, design that doesn't meet uh, criteria. And, and there may be, you know, it may turn out that perhaps in the vehicular area the operational and safety performance shows one thing, but for the other modes the operational and safety performance um, uh, shows an, uh, something else and so you're really just trying to show how you're quantify how you're quantifying that trade-off and uh, the d just back up for the decisions that you're making. Uh, of course we also want to look at the right-of-way impacts many times uh, we have design exceptions are needed to reduce the right-of-way impact to reduce the impact to the human and natural environment uh, to reduce the impact on the community uh, the needs of other users so there's, there's many reasons for design exceptions and we just need to see an analysis that talks through those. In addition, um, design speed and design loading structural capacity would 
apply to um, every project, uh, low or high speed. And really, exceptions to both of those should be very, very rare. So if we have a design speed exception, uh, but prior to considering a design speed exception, we really should look at exceptions to the individual elements, like stopping site distance or super elevation that don't meet the criteria. Uh, in the rare instance, it's determined that an exception to design speed is appropriate in a special circumstance. Uh, in addition to the things we already mentioned, the design exception should talk about the length of section with the reduced design speed, how that compares to the overall project, and how you'll transition to adjacent sections that have a higher design speed. And then I think I skipped one, the design loading structural capacity exception would have an additional uh, documentation to verify that the safe load carrying capacity um, or the load rating for all state unrestricted legal loads or uh, routine permit loads uh, can, be, can be met. I'm sorry, I'm having technical issues. Um, so uh, just to recap, for design exception approvals, we clarify in the notice that for national highway system routes with controlling criteria uh, exceptions, uh, either federal highway or the state would approve those if the state has assumed that responsibility through an oversight agreement. Uh, project on the national highway system, but you're not meeting some non-controlling criteria uh, that's up to the state to uh, handle, as well as exceptions to non on non-NHS facilities. And the states can document those exceptions in accordance with their laws and safety standards and regulations and so forth. But we do encourage agencies to document all design exceptions. Um, so we, we have a... a trail of how those decisions were made, uh, which can be very helpful to you later if those decisions are challenged. And then we're just, through this proposal, trying to streamline um, our administrative efforts to ensure that we're just requiring uh, exceptions for the criteria and in the context where we have the largest effect on safety and operations. Um, we're really interested in uh, receiving your comments on this proposal. Uh, it's not a rule per se. It's um, it's a kind of a policy memo, but it's been put out there for public comment. So I encourage you to go to regulations.gov. Uh, you can search for controlling criteria design or the docket number shown here and it'll pop right up. And then uh, you read through the materials and hit that comment now button and send us your comments by December 7th. That's all I've got. I'll turn it back over to uh, Robbie. Thank you. Uh, I just think we've had such a wonderful group of people, um, and I really appreciate everybody taking the time to uh, log on to this webinar so that we can we can answer some of these questions. And I do want to mention to people that if you're on the webinar and you have a question, please. Uh, go ahead and type that question into the chat box. If you can't find the chat box, you may have to go to the upper right-hand corner of your screen and click on the little orange arrow, and that should bring the chat box up. And um, I am going to turn over the question uh, list to Mary Ebeling, who is also here at SSTI. Uh, she's been uh, scrolling through them and finding uh, questions so, um, Mary, I'm going to let you go ahead and read those off. All right. All right. Um, hey, folks. Um, I have a couple questions I can start off with. Um, and while I were asking these and getting answers, I encourage anybody who has additional questions to type those into the chat box. Um, the first question um, is basically what if my local office, and I'm assuming we're talking about FHWA division office, uh, isn't cooperating or doesn't know the answer to a question, what steps should um, the project developer or uh, designer take to, uh, to address this and, and whom should they contact? I think this could also be not just FHWA division office but also 
um, a state DOT office. Who, what are what's the what are the steps to take to um, to sort of get those people on board with these changes? So um, this is Sherry. Just to kind of in general, um, we're we're all trying to move in this in a collaborative way, and all try to bring each other up to speed with what's working and what's not working around the country. So we really hope everything stays in a, a positive, collaborative, problem-solving approach. Uh, in general, though, however, the you know the program is a state-led program, and the state and the division office will be the point people in responding to any concerns for any federal aid expenditure of funds in that state. We hope that the information that we are plastering around the country uh, on our website and through our various outreach efforts is, is making it out to people. And so what, if, if folks still aren't getting to a good resolution, then I would maybe encourage uh, the, those states to maybe have just a technical assistance call and maybe bring headquarters or resource center folks in that have subject matter expertise or experience with the context of the issues that are being addressed and uh, maybe have a conversation that might add value so that people can uh, uh, get to the same place. Um, if there's just something that's plain wrong, you know, you can prove it. You know, if you're really having a problem, you, you can certainly elevate it to, to uh, higher levels of leadership. And But hopefully these things can be addressed at the staff level. Okay, that actually brings up a question in my mind. Um, so as far as if technical assistance is desired um, from a state or an MPO um, or whatever, who, how would they how would they proceed in making that happen? I think that would be a useful thing to know. Yeah, again, folks should go through their um, state DOT first, and the state DOT is going to know who at the division to ask, and they should just request some technical assistance. And that's what the, our state uh, point of contacts do. We've got uh, bike ped point of contacts in each of the states. We're trying to keep them up to speed with that, all the information. And they know who this, I mean, there's like 15 experts here sitting around the table right now with uh, competency in this area that can uh, share examples and resources. So it's, it's just a matter of requesting that, requesting those, that technical assistance. And awesome. working that's up the chain, absolutely. and they, yeah. Yeah, that, that's super um, helpful. I just wanted to make it abundantly clear um, you all are offering um, a high level of assistance, it sounds like. Um, the next question I have um, is basically now that some of the criteria won't be required, the controlling criteria, um, uh, what, how does that change how states need to be accountable for upholding safety and design? Oh, this is Elizabeth. I don't I don't know that it changes anything. Um, certainly the engineer sealing the plans is responsible for, uh, for their design work. Um, and the state responsibility, I think, is, is the same. Uh, it really just removes, it doesn't remove the criteria. The criteria are still in the publications. Um, it just removes federal, federal highway approval uh, from the administrative process, you know, in many cases. Uh, we'll still be involved with, with approvals of exceptions on higher speed, high volume, uh, well, higher speed roadways, but um, take, take the federal highway approval level uh, and requirement out from a lot of uh, more local urban street type projects. Okay, um, so we do have questions coming in. So first I will um, address just the very general one that uh, has been asked a couple times. The webinar will be available, the slide deck will be available on the SSTI website. And also we will put up a link to the document the misconceptions document that came out um, from FHWA in August. We'll put a link um, under the description for this webinar uh, so that people can get that. And the recording will be up there as well. So you can refer back to that. Also, um, let's see, we have a question. Let's see, myth number seven. Is there a consideration to allow communities with licensed engineers 
to use a design exception. Um, these are often approved by DOTs with lots of highway knowledge, but very little urban environment experience. Um, I think that sometimes DOTs seem to, I think the, the questioner is wondering whether there's sort of a one size fits all concern at uh, state DOTs, and so it's harder to get design exceptions. So is there any way to approve, to have a licensed engineer um, be able to use those? This, this is Elizabeth, and I'll ask Mick to chime in if I miss something. But, um, you know, here again with our uh, proposed revisions to the controlling criteria for a low, lower speed street under 50 miles an hour, uh, Federal Highway would not be involved in the approval of a design exception for lane width. Uh, we would defer to the states on how they want to uh, handle that in accordance with their, you know, legal environment. It's different in every state um, uh, and their policies and so forth. And so, uh, really, it's it's up to the state on how they set up that process and. You know, there's there's no mandate on what that process be from a federal highway perspective. Okay. Um, we have a question here. Key design elements for bike safety are design speed and lane width. Um, and you've talked earlier about the flexibility allowed for both of these topics. How do controlling criteria relate to the flexible design strategies you discussed earlier vis-a-vis uh, -vis design speed and line, lane width. Uh, this is Elizabeth again. Uh, Dan, maybe you may have something to add here, but I think uh, what we're working on, as Sherry mentioned, uh, these things are all uh, being developed in concert and um, all working towards improved flexibility. So. Our uh, infrastructure's proposed changes to the controlling criteria. Um, design speed would still be an important controlling criteria for at every speed um, or for every roadway. Uh, lane width, here again, we'd, we'd remove a federal highway uh, approval requirement for the lower speed environment. But the, it, it all works together towards increasing the uh, flexibility that uh, state and local engineers uh, working in their urban context in particular uh, have in arriving at the best overall solution that's going to provide the best safety and mobility for a wide variety of users. I think there's a follow-up here um, actually from a different source but on a similar topic and that is that uh, Lane, if lane width is no longer a criteria for roadways, would that eliminate having to follow the green book on local national highway system roadways? Uh, there seems to be some contradiction that lane width is no longer a consideration, but green book still needs to be followed. And I think that um, what he's probably talking about is, low, is uh, urban low speed roadways that are listed on the national highway system. Uh, for instance, where right. we've, roads run we've, we've adopted, sorry, go ahead. Where, where national highway system roads run through an urban environment and really are, by most local citizens' consideration, sort of a local street. Right, and that's that's one uh, reason uh, combined with recent research that we wanted to go back and take a look at the controlling criteria. But I want to be very clear. Uh, Federal Highway has adopted the Green Book as the standard for National Highway System routes. So if, if you're on a National Highway System, the Green Book is the standard. Um, there's a lot of flexibility in the Green Book for design, even with regard to lane width. There's, there's a lot of flexibility. You know, look through it. If somebody tells you the Green Book won't allow it, look through it for that roadway type and see what flexibility is allowed. But if you need a design exception, the criteria is still in the Green Book, and the Green Book is still the standard. But if you need an exception, 
because we will no longer, under our proposal, we would not consider lane width a controlling criteria in a low speed environment. That exception doesn't have to come to Federal Highway for approval. Elizabeth, if I could just jump in and mention that um, we put out the design flexibility in 2013. One of the projects we're working on right now and that will be coming out this spring is a document that really focuses on showing examples of appropriate design flexibility. Um, so we will be talking about the lane width question um, because obviously there's a, a very direct relationship between the, the minimum width of the lanes and the ability to provide on-road bike facilities. Um, so that's a resource that will be coming out um, from FHWA this spring, um, focusing exactly on these topics um, and building off of the controlling criteria and other design flexibility um, work that's happening throughout the organization. Okay. Um, I know we are, we are about out of time. Um, I wanted to give Sherry Schaffline one minute um, to make sure that people are aware of an upcoming webinar um, where we are going to be talking about some of these details, these um, issues in more detail, and I wanted to make sure everybody um, is aware of this and is able to sign up. Sherry? Yes, on November 19th from 3 to 4.30 Eastern Time, uh, we'll be sponsoring a, another webinar on performance-based practical design, integration into transportation project and agency practice webinar. And a couple SSTI states, uh, including Washington State and Oregon, uh, as well as the city of Portland, will have presenters on that to share some of their case studies. This is part of our context sensitive solutions and design webinar series. Uh, so to sign up, I'd encourage folks to go to the uh, one word context sensitive solutions org, and you can register from there. Um, so if this piqued your interest or you have some more questions, that'll be another live opportunity uh, to share with your colleagues and maybe have to soak in. And if there's some follow up questions by SSTI staff or others are welcome to join and continue the national conversation on flexibility in highway design that's going to support um, multimodal outcomes and uh, good livability outcomes. Great. Thank you, Sherry. Okay. Well, I know people probably have, um, have to jump off. Um, I do want to mention that uh, we will have this up on our website. We'll have the slides up. And if you are interested in future webinars from SSTI, you can go to our website, uh, follow us on Twitter, and also subscribe to our newsletter to find out about future webinars. Uh, we will have one in probably mid-December on uh, the multimodal, uh, I can't remember what it stands for, M2D2 with Smart, with Smart Growth America on um, some of their work with states development now. Yeah. So thank you to everyone. I really appreciate all the folks from uh, Federal Highways for helping us out today. And um, I hope we've cleared up some of the misconceptions. And thank you for every, every, to everyone else for uh, joining us and logging on and lots of great questions. <laughs>